only mode. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on OSHA inspection preparation. My name is James and I'll be your moderator for today's event. So before we dive into the presentation and hand things over to our speaker, I'd like to run through some housekeeping items, uh, some things to keep in mind uh, throughout this next hour, uh, which will hope get everyone in line. Uh, the purpose of the session today is to provide some best practices and tactics for getting better prepared for your next OSHA inspection. And our speaker will provide some practical tips, uh, which will hopefully help you minimize the risk of, of getting a violation. Uh, so our speaker will address the agenda in more detail. Following the presentation, there will be an open question and answer period. Please note you can ask questions anytime throughout the webinar by typing them into the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll just save them for the end. Everyone's microphones will be turned off for the entirety of the session, but if you do have a question or a technical issue comes up, once again, you can use that questions pane to communicate. Please keep in mind, any and all unanswered questions will be addressed and followed up on via email after the presentation. And most importantly, you will receive a copy of the slide deck and the re webinar recording sometime tomorrow. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Rick Foote. Rick is the EHS Consulting Manager here at Triumvirate Environmental. He has over 25 years of experience in the EHS world. He's also an OSHA 501 instructor and has spoken at many conferences and events around the country and has done a few of these webinars for us as well. So with that, I'll turn things over to Rick. Okay, thank you, James. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. If hopefully it's afternoon where you are. Anyway, so yes, what I want to do today is kind of prepare you to what to expect if OSHA comes knocking at your door. As probably most of you are aware of, OSHA has been extremely busy as of the late, and there's been a lot of inspections. As you can see here, you know, roughly 92,000 inspections have occurred, and then there were also over 188,000 violations cited. So you kind of do the math, that's almost you know, two violations per visit, which adds up to you know, about $240 million in penalties. So I don't think any of us want to get fined by OSHA because their fines, you know, I hear a lot from people that say, oh, it's not that bad, you know, they don't fine us that much, but it appears that they're actually getting more and more violations and the penalties are actually increasing instead of decreasing. So with that, what I'd like to do is run through with you what the top 10 violations have been. And again, you know, you know, the order pretty much stays the same. Some things slide a little bit here and there. But for the most part, it's exactly the same. As we can see, fall protection is number one. And I hear from a lot of people that think, oh, fall protection, that's only for construction activities. But you've got to keep in mind that a lot of people get confused with the construction standards and the general industry standards. Because depending upon the activities of your employees, your employees could actually being, be doing construction. You know, activities that are covered under the fall protection regulations, such as activities up on a rooftop, you know, changing filters or something like that, where, depending on where they are on the roof, they could be require fall protection. So, you know, it, I think that's an important one that everybody needs to look at at your own facilities to see the activities that you're actually doing. Of course, as you all know, number two is HAZCOM, right? The revised hazard communication standard. We recently had done a webinar on that talking about you know, the inspection protocols, which to date I haven't heard of any inspections, but that doesn't mean they haven't occurred. But I'm sure they're going to occur very soon in the future here. So it is important for people to you know, really be getting that up to date. So then we got scaffolding, respiratory protection. Most things with respiratory protection are not doing the annual fit testing, or you don't have a written program, or you know something's missing in the program. Of course, lockout tagout, everybody's favorite, right? Is you know that again, lockout tagout. Most people don't do the annual reviews, or they just don't have lockout tagout procedures for all the equipment that's needed. So you know, keep going on with the top ten. You know, we got the pit, right? Powered industrial trucks. Again, no training typically is the one, unsafe use, no observations, a lot of different items on that one. Ladders, everybody's favorite, right, is ladders. Most people don't realize that they're supposed to be doing inspections on ladders prior to use, every time prior to use, and that's typically, you know, what happens is people are, you know, not doing it properly, so therefore they keep trying to, you know, people get hurt, people fall off of them anything like that. 
was electrical. When we get into electrical, now we're talking about arc flash, as well as you know improper wiring, the use of extension cords, no GFCIs. So a lot of different things under electrical. Then we get into you know machine guarding again, missing machine guards, misplaced machine guards, not in place, not proper, not properly guarded, no training, multiple different issues there. And of course, electrical and electrical you see it on here twice because if you you know really think about it, you know when you electrical is a huge part of the regulations and. It has multiple different legs, and there's two different sections in it. You get into the wiring section, and then you get into the general requirements. So you've got to look at both of those applications in order to make sure that you are actually covering everything that's required under the electrical. So that's a big one for a lot of people. And it still applies to every location. I like to stress that just based on the fact that some people you know, don't think that it applies because, oh, we don't have electricians on site, but that's not always the case. So I want you to really, you know, take away from this is to say, no, we do have, you know, that we can have, you know, multiple different incidences here with electrical issues. All right. So with that in mind, what I like to do now is really say, okay, are you ready for ocean to knock at your door? And again, this is probably a good poll question, but you know, is how many of you are actually ex I don't want to say excited, but you know, not really worried about it if OSHA comes knocking at your door. Because to us, and even in my long my I want oh God, I just said long career, I guess it has been, is in my career I've gone to numerous OSHA, OSHA inspections, as well as I know some of them that have gone as long as 30 days. So really the whole key to this is nothing more than preparation, right? If you're fully prepared for them to come in, usually the inspections will go well. The problem is with most people is they're not really prepared for that to happen. And then the panic sets in and like, oh my God, some, you know, they're going to find all these issues and all of that. Well, this is what we want to hopefully alleviate you from worrying about is to say, all right, if you have a plan and here's the process in which we think you could follow, which we found success with as we go along here. So one of the first things we always say to do is form a committee. And the reason why I get a lot of questions on this is why should we have a committee of different people? They don't all have things to do with OSHA. But it's more because as all of the different people that we show on this slide, on different departments, and I'm sure some of you would could add some, take some away, you know, however you want to play it out here, is to say the reason why we say all of these are vital pieces to a committee is each one of these groups or people have some individual knowledge that may be helpful during an actual inspection. When you think about it, you know, the EHS manager, you know, all of us, yes, we know a lot of what goes on in a facility, but we might not know everything. So it's nice to know that these people are actually prepared for an inspection so that they know, hey, what is this? Or what does that HVAC unit go to? Or how do we change out the filters up on the roof? Or how do we enter a confined space? Where's our confined space entry permits? Where's our chemical inventory? What goes on in this different areas? So that's why we say form a committee. So again, people are better prepared to know how to answer questions, how to you know, be approached when OSHA comes knocking. Anything along those lines could be extremely helpful during this process. From there, we say we, you got to really organize all of your internal resources. As we called it, you know, this committee here is, you know, really what is the role of each one of these, right? So we think that you should have a coordinating committee. Then you want to designate certain facility you know, inspectors, managers, inspectors, experts, whatever you want to call them. You know, then you got to do the logistics and planning, designate the roles and responsibilities. And in my personal opinion, the most important part here is the communication. How do we communicate while OSHA is on site? So with that, I would like to get into a little more detail on each one of these different individual tasks. So the Inspection Preparedness Coordinating Committee is literally the group that you want to organize and they facilitate the opening conference. I always say the opening conference is a great opportunity for you, the, the inspectee, to really share with the inspectors you know, the, all the information that they should know about your facility, number one, 
about the safety protocols that you have in place. It might be that you need steel toe shoes or hard hats or you know PPE or there's certain areas that are restricted or that if you have clean rooms or anything like that. It really helps out the inspectors to know all of this information prior. And some clients, some people I've even seen, they put together a great PowerPoint presentation on you know, all their wonderful programs and a little history about their facility and things like that. It's all great. It, it actually helps, you know, kind of relax the inspector so that they're like, hey, it's, you know, you're well prepared for them to come walking in the door. But also, on the back side of it, what I say too is it could buy you a little bit of time to, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here, is send out some floor sweeps just to kind of tidy up if needed, you know, maybe straighten out certain things that, you know, you can quickly take care of before the inspectors come through. So also during this opening conference, if you will, is you want to work out the schedule with the inspectors. What time will they be there? What days are they going to be there? What time do they plan on leaving? You know, do they plan on going out in the facility? Do they plan on doing employee interviews? All of these things are great to have the committee there because if you're just an individual, as we all know, sometimes we may miss something that's said, and it's great to have other ears and eyes sitting there listening also, and they can get their people prepared if the they're going to be inspected. The biggest part here too with the committee is always make sure you're doing your daily debriefings. Kind of again, summarize everything that was seen, everything that was said, you know, anything that could be followed up during the time period that they're not there. You know, it's okay to go and correct minor issues before they, you know, before they come back the next day. Sometimes they'll still show up in the report, but at least in the report it'll say correct it. Or sometimes if you're lucky, they just don't do anything. It's like, oh, okay, it's, you know, you don't need, you won't see it on the final report, which I think is always great, but can't say it happens every time. So, and again, you want to organize and facilitate the closing conference because this is where you usually want, you know, the president of the company or whoever high-ranking official, as I always say, um, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, this stuff is all organized and to make sure that we're in good shape. Okay. So from there, our inspectors or escorts, as we like to call them, is their job, and, and this is one that you know we find is very, very helpful, is if you actually train individuals to know how to turn around and walk around with inspectors and to make sure their information is correct. And what we mean by that is, is you know, these people, you don't want just anybody walking around with an OSHA inspector because we all know they can do some leading questions or the questions might be difficult or something like that. So you want to make sure that these individuals know what's going on and they're allowed to, you know, they know the facility well and they know the process. So therefore, like as it says here, they can, you know, intercede when there's a leading question or they know how to, you know, tactfully restate the questions or, you know, really direct the inspectors to certain areas really where you want them to go. You know, you can, can kind of control the process to some degree. You know, granted, you know, because the idea is you don't want the OSHA inspectors just kind of wandering around your facility. You really want to keep it tight, and that's what this, these people's roles are, is to be able to take a look at it and move along. So, obviously, some big key tips here during the inspection is Everything needs to be up to date. One of the biggest issues we see when we're out auditing is this, is that most plans, they're written, but they sit there or, you know, and then they're never updated for years upon years. And information is incorrect. Typically, what we find, phone numbers, people are left. And I remember once I was doing an audit at a facility and a person said, oh, yeah, that guy, did, you know, died like five years ago and his number was still on the phone, on the phone list. I don't think you're able to call him. Okay, so, you know, little things like that. You also want to make sure you know where all your records are. Be prepared. One of my key things when I was an EHS manager is I used to have all my plans and documents and binders ready to go. So if I had an OSHA inspector come in, I grabbed those couple of binders and, you know, always just brought them into a conference room, handed them to the inspectors, and they were all happy. Things started off very well, and that's really what you want. The best part of it is, is to say, hey, you know, we're ready, we're prepared, we know you might come, as they like that. The idea is to set the tone of the inspection and to show them that you're organized 
and not really disorganized, because the more disorganized you are, obviously they're going to think, ooh, you know, there's going to be more violations potentially. So again, have that preparedness plan. Do you have a written document? Not that you're required to have this. I want to stress that this is not required by OSHA. But do you have a preparedness plan that says, okay, how are we going to do things? Do we have a path laid out that we're going to go to different facilities, you know, different parts? How are we going to walk them through, you know, the facility? You know, is it we're going to start from, you know, area A to Z, or are you going to start from area H to Z and then back to A? You know, all of that. It's really all up to you what to do. So from there, too, you want to make sure that you have a conference room. Um, don't use your office. I did that, oh, God, when I first started in this business, I remember it. My first inspection, it was a local um, EH, you know, environmental inspection, but I thought it was good. I brought them into my office, and, you know, I learned a lesson pretty quickly. They told me, hey, that's not a good thing. No training, didn't know, thought I was doing the right thing. But if you bring them into an area like that and they see files, they can request to see them because why they say that you presented them to them. So only give them to, like I said, only the documents that they ask for. Sometimes we like to get proactive and say, oh, let me give them all of this. But if they don't specifically ask for it, I would not give it to them because, again, now you're opening yourself up to say, hey, there's more things here that they can look at. If they make copies, you want to make duplicate copies. That's very, very, very important because, again, as time goes on, if, you know, you need to, you know, argue something that you're not sure about or something like that, you know, you really want to make sure you both have the same copies. So what happens during the inspection? I'm sure there's some of you on this call, on this webinar, I should say, Yes, it's a call, right? Either way you want to call it. But anyways, is you've already been through an inspection. But, you know, one of them is, is that internal notification process. I always think this is the best thing. I used to refer to them as floor sweepers, i.e., they run around kind of saying, hey, guess what, OSHA's here, you know, and clean up things. You know, people would know to tidy up pretty quick. You know, any minor things that can be taken care of, even though we all say, you know, it should be that way anyways, but it does happen where, you know, things happen like that. So, but, you know, again, when you enact that plan, you're going to have that opening conference. You're going to have the schedule. You're going to figure out what the debriefing is. All of this stuff is that logistics and planning, making sure people are present. Maybe somebody's at another site. You don't want to get them back to the site. So you also have the right to kind of move things around a little bit. So what happens during, you know, again, the opening conference, kind of mentioned this a little bit, but, again, it's, you know, make sure you have the right people in the right rooms, too. It's this is the best time that you can show them what you do and how you do it, and it shows a lot too if you're able to have you know higher management in there because it shows that commitment from them. I know sometimes that's impossible to do, but if you can, you should. And I've seen it more and more too, where actually you know sometimes the president of the company is in a different location or something like that. But even during an audit or during the inspection, that they actually will call in now and say, "Hey, just you know, patch me in, and we can talk about it." So at least they're hearing everything, and they get to, you know, push what's going on in that facility. Most importantly, is the last piece of this slide here too, which is an understanding of the inspection scope. What we mean by that is very simply, what are they there to look at? Is this a full-blown inspection, or is this a you know, very specific one. Because when they identify the nature and scope, if they say, okay, this is multimedia, as we like to call it, right, we're looking at everything. We're looking at every OSHA, you know, regulation, all 20 of them or 20 plus, right, and we want to make sure we know exactly what's going on in every area. Or it could be we're here for a very specific purpose. Some of you on this call, too, I'm sure you had this done as recently, like the silica. I know I had very, you know, several clients that OSHA showed up and they were there. They wanted to do some industrial hygiene monitoring, IH monitoring, for potential exposure to silica. So that's all they came in for. That's all they focused on. They went directly to those areas where the potential for silica exposure was. They took their samples and they went home. And other times, they're going to come in, like I said, and look at everything from top to bottom. So you really want to get that idea right away. You also want to figure out, all right, how long do you expect to be here? 
it's not a, you know, people say, oh, that's a bad question. It's like, no, it's actually not a bad question. It's just so that you can pre-plan to know, okay, they expect to be there two or three days, or they expect to be there a week, or is it 30 days, you know, whatever it is, or somewhere in between, it's always a good thing to know that up front. So, again, you want to cooperate with them, but don't offer additional information unless you're requesting. Some inspectors are really good, as I call it, is they try to become your friends. So as they get friendlier with you, as you know, you tend to, you know, become a little bit more of a gabber jar, as I like to call it, where you share more information than you probably should. So that's something that you want to, make, you know, watch off, obviously. Okay, make sure you take good notes. If you question everything. As I always say, I always play it back to the inspector. Just so I understand you correctly, you are saying that there was a violation with this, right? And, you know, even, you know, questions say, or it's okay to say, could you show me afterwards where in the regulations you are, you know, you're, you're, you're stating that's incorrect that we have here. So little things like that always helps out because, again, we all want to make sure the communication is proper. And make sure you monitor employee interviews. That's a key thing. Because again, you know, just your luck, right? You're going to get the disgruntled employee that says everything's wrong, and you don't give them PPE or anything like that. Or the vice versa is somebody that, you know, again, sometimes language is a barrier, so you want to make sure of that. You just want to make sure too, because most inspectors don't talk. The word I use is your language, and what I mean by that is it's kind of the language of the facility. As we all know, every company, every institution. They all have their own language, the way they speak, because they know this area, that area. So that's an important one just to kind of look at and talk about. And again, do the exit interview for each area. Again, kind of reiterating, what did you see? What did you find? What do you know? All of those things, because that is important. It's your chance to clarify something. And if you wait till later on at the end of the day or something like that, then it might just be like, oh, I thought earlier we saw this. I hear that a lot. Oh, I think this or that. You know, it, it becomes more of a let's just do it right then and there and make sure we clarify it. So for the escorts, what is their job? Their job is very simply, it is actually a very simple one, but probably, in my opinion, the most important one, which is to really reiterate those questions, like I said. They're the ones that are going to be attached to the inspector's hip, as I like to say, which means by that is they're going to direct them. They're going to push, you know, walk them through the facility. They're going to answer any questions that they can. They're going to know who to bring the inspector to for questions. Their job is to take all of the notes, you know, anything like that. You know, and again, also make sure, you know, if there's any issues, you know, during that time, they could be you know, they can make sure that they're like, hey, well, we corrected that issue, or am I understanding you correctly? You know, anything like that, that's where the escort comes in, and that's somebody you want to be designated, someone that knows the facility well, somebody that's gone through training. When we say training, is more or less like, all right, all kinds of questions, like give them misleading questions, see how they answer them. So you want to better prepare them, because as we all know, if you're better prepared, you're going to answer questions better. So, as I said earlier here, taking care of business, as we like to call it, right, is make sure that you are actually, anything you can find that you can fix immediately, that is something you want to do. I, I always say it's the best thing you can do, and you want to, you know, as they do it, obviously, if you can do it prior to then, that's even much better, right? But we all know some things you can't correct right then and there. But you also want to make sure that, you know, if you've got processes in place, and this, I, this has worked well for me over the years, is if you tell OSHA, hey, you know what, yeah, we got a lockout tagout program, but, you know, we've identified maybe 50% of our equipment that needs to be locked out and tagged out and have procedures written for, but we haven't gotten to all of them yet, but we're in the process. You know, sometimes you get a break there and they may say to you, hey, well, okay, well, when do you think that's going to be done? And give them a realistic timeline and they may let that go and say, okay, but guess what? We'll be back in three months, six months, whatever it is you say, and we're going to finish the inspection of that program. 
So you also want to say if there is potential violations, let them know that you're, you know, what you're doing about it, and that you've actually identified it and you're working towards a fix. Because some people won't do that, and then they sit there and they go, oh, you know, I should have told them that. And it may buy you some. It may, it may not. Again, I can't say in every single case that that's, you know, that's okay. That the inspector is just going to kind of back off, but. I've had it very successful in the past that really their job, what is the job of the OSHA inspector? Well, the job of an OSHA inspector, right, is to help you to get into compliance. So if you're telling them you're working towards that cause, a lot of times that will be very, very helpful to them. All right, so what happens? So the inspectors go through, they find, you know, 10, 12 different issues. You know, at your facility, and now they say, "Okay, we want to have a closing conference." There's a big difference here. You know, I want to be clear on this too. Is you have your daily debriefings, which the daily debriefing is really just a summary of the activities of that day, and then they'll be back the next day. The closing conference is your chance to present, as you know, as well as OSHA is going to present all of their findings, if you will. So there should be no surprises when you get your formal letter back, whatever time span that that's in, is typically what they'll do is they'll sit there and kind of run through each one of those. But it's also more importantly is it's an opportunity for you to present information you know, that may not have been available when they requested it. So let's say it might have been a plan or something that you had and you know that person wasn't in the day that they asked for it. Well, now you have the right to give it to them at that moment, and then they can say, okay, you know, then that, that covers that. And it's also the ability that you can answer any questions that you couldn't answer prior. Again, the most common one that I always see is somebody's on vacation or somebody's not around, something like that, that, again, it gives you that opportunity. Please keep in mind, too, that, you know, the inspectors are going to run through all of the different things that they find, you know, but that doesn't mean necessarily that you are going to get fined for all of those. Basically, now they'll go back and they kind of review everything, and then it goes before another committee that'll say if it's a violation or not. So, some more guidelines here for you. I, I can't stress the first one enough. Take good notes. Okay? It really, really is the key because that's going to help you later on to kind of say, okay, in, in anticipation of the letter coming, what can we do to correct things? So I always think that's very, very important to make sure you have good notes. Obviously, the second one, don't, you know, don't deal with hypotheticals because they're going to do, well, if, you know, you had this, there's a process safety management rules kick in. You know, don't even deal with those. So, no, we just deal with things that are facts. Obviously, you're going to fix things. You're going to make copies. Okay, make sure that, you know, you're taking, if they take photos, if you allow photos, you know, you can tell them that are, you know, again, trade secrets, whatever, for whatever reasons, you know, you're not allowed to take photos, that's fine. And the worst case is if they, you know, they say we must take a photo, well, then you usually have them sign the documentation for that. But also, too, if they take any type of samples, like if you're doing any IH, industrial hygiene sampling, anything like that, you want to also take a sample right alongside of them is it's always good to do that to make sure that there's no differences or major differences between the two. They actually like it. Like I said, with the silica, I had a client that did that. We did it, and, you know, they're like, that's great. So we know that, and they asked for the results, and ours came back exactly the same, which was a great thing. Okay? Otherwise, don't offer any opinion. You know, don't agree or disagree with the inspectors. I've seen people argue with inspectors. That's never a good thing. Okay. Um, don't, you know, you can talk about sports, but don't be their buddy because they want to, you know, again, they want some of them try to mislead you. I'm not saying they're bad people. they got a job to do, but their job is to really figure out what exactly is going on and how are things going on. Okay. Don't sign anything, again, because you shouldn't unless you're authorized and you know what you're signing. And obviously, keep them away from harm's way. You, I hear of stories where, you know, inspectors have walked into high hazard areas because nobody was telling them not to, you know, anything like that. That's never a good thing, right? Okay. Again, don't offer more information. Don't complain about the regulations. We all know the regulations are really fun to deal with, right, every day. 
Uh, yeah, okay. You know, but again, and don't be pushed into giving an answer. You know how they keep trying to push you on a question and, you know, trying to really dig as well as don't be evasive. If you don't know, just say, I don't know, let me find out. And also, don't lie to the inspectors or, you know, don't, don't really, you know, go in a different direction than you should because most people there will get all confused and be worried to, you know, start saying something wrong or anything like that. Common sense applies, right? But again, unless you train your escorts or the people who are going to be answering these questions, they may not be aware of this. And this is sometimes where people get hung up or get a violation because somebody speculated or somebody kind of said something inappropriate and it gets totally misinterpreted and then it makes it sound like you do have it an issue that you may not really have. A big part too that people miss or you know aren't aware of is all the different training requirements under OSHA. So it's a very easily citable part of the regulations and what I did here is on the next few slides you're going to see that these are all of the regulations in which OSHA requires some sort of training. Now, when I say some sort of it, it could be a five-minute training. It could be a 24-hour training. It's all over the place. It depends on the complexity of your institution as well as what are the needs of that, you know, what's applicable, I should say. Okay, so obviously here, too, we know emergency action plans, right? That you got to have training. you got to know how people can get out. What do they do? Where do they go? Fire prevention, noise exposure, right? you got to do annual audiometric testing if you have a hearing program in place. Right? We've got to teach people about flammable liquids. A big thing today, right, is PSM, process safety management. That's becoming a bigger and bigger issue around OSHA. So it is something you want to look at. And when was the last time you looked at the amount of chemicals you have on site and matched it up to the OSHA PSM levels? That's something you may want to look at. And then, of course, spill response has, you know, 1910-120. It could be anywhere from awareness training, which takes a few hours, which, again, is anybody that's likely to witness a spill, which is pretty much, in my opinion, almost anybody in your facility. That's something, you know, you've got to do training on that. And then if you're going to expect them to do anything, they've got to have at least eight hours' worth of training to do defensive measures, which is something like throwing a spill stock down. Or if you really want them to clean it up, well, then they're going to have a minimum of 24 hours training. So as you can see, there's a lot of training that goes into all of these. We keep going. Respiratory protection. We just saw that earlier on the slide, right? It's one of the top ten. It was in the, the bottom five to ten. Again, that's a big one. you got to do it. Lockout, tagout. You know, that's part, you know, again, a big one. you got to train people on the operations. you got to train people on signs. What do the signs mean? What do the tags mean? PPE, if we go back up to PPE, job safety analysis, job hazard analysis, how do you do that? How do people know what PPE to wear? You got fire extinguishers in your facility, you got to train people on the proper use of fire extinguishers, right? That's become a hot topic, right? Because some will see a lot out there now that if you have fire extinguishers, right, the intent is people are going to use them, right? That, so, and then that means you got to train people. It, it's kind of one of those more complicated ones. Powered industrial trucks, we mentioned that one earlier, right? That was one on, again, in the top 10 list. You got hoist and slings, you know, you're handling material. You got to teach them how to do the inspections on the slings, how to do inspections on your, on any of your lifting equipment. Keep going, you know, again, more electrical. I don't think, hopefully, nobody here is using, doing any logging. Um, but you never know. If you are, guess what? You have to do this. So you can see. Almost every single regulation requires it. Of course, you got the annual bloodborne pathogens training, right, for anybody, again, or universal precautions, as we like to call it today. It's another one that's, you know, again, very, very common out there. Then we get this one here, a lot of people miss, too, is access to exposure, employee exposure and medical records, which, again, you know, if there's two differences here. There's a major difference between the two. Right, and employee exposure is when you do like area sampling for, you know, let's say, again, silica, if we're doing an area or something like that, or a medical record, those are covered under HIPAA, and those are very specific to an individual, and that's more private information, so that's something that, you know, you really got to train employees about. What is their rights? Because they have a right to employee exposure records, but they don't, not all employees have a right to anybody else's 
medical records. So again, you got lead, you got chromium six, you got cadmium. Any of these and all of these require some type of training. And of course, you have you know has a communication. Everybody should have already been trained on the revised has a communication standard. I find it funny. I don't know if funny is the right word, but I do find it you know that still to this day that some people have not done that initial training that was required three years ago. So or uh, how well how well is your training? Have you gone around and actually quizzed people on the pictograms? Do they know what they are? Are they able to recognize them? Do they know what they mean? You know, it's a really good tool to say how effective your training was. If they, uh, you know, if a majority of them can't recognize it, then it may say to you, hey, we should do some retraining on this. So I get that question a lot. Under the hazard communication standard, do we have to do annual training? No, it does not say that. It clearly does not say it has to be annual. It just says anytime there's a change of hazards in the facility, then you need to do training. So same thing with, you know, hazardous chemicals in laboratories. A lot of people have just a, you know, have just a chemical hygiene plan, as this is commonly referred to, which is great because a chemical hygiene plan training is good for anybody that works with chemicals on a laboratory scale. But what about others in your facility? Do they work with chemicals on a non-laboratory scale? If they do, then you got to do has a communication training. So it could be that you need to do both trainings and not just one. So as you can see here with the training, there's a lot of training pieces to it. OSHA's got a great document, if you go onto the OSHA website too, that lists out all of the training requirements. I always tell my client I think it's a great tool to look at because it really details out the who, what, when, and where, as I like to call it, of training because there is a lot of pieces to it. All right, so a little bit more here on preparedness. What do you want to do? How, how best can you be prepared? Okay, is we always suggest that we, you know, you develop an OSHA compliance calendar. Really, I like to call it an environmental health and safety compliance calendar, but if you are just responsible for safety, then you want to have an OSHA compliance calendar. What you're going to have in your compliance calendar is everything that's applicable to your facility, and then try to say that, okay, kind of an example here is, like, are all your written plans up to date? Sometimes I see a compliance calendar that will say in January, you know, review all of our written plans. And I was always like, well, there you go. You're setting yourself up for failure, right? It's better to say, okay, I'm going to check a plan in January, one in February, one in March. Because more realistically, you can review one plan a month and instead of figuring out, oh, my God, i got to review 10, 15 plans in a month, it's never going to happen. So from there, you know, also you want to have a training metrics. Who needs to be trained and what? And maybe it's not job title. I always say it should be not person title. Sorry, I meant to say is you really want to have job titles or job descriptions associated with a job description. They need to have this training. That way, there it's easy to say, okay, here's our whole training matrix that you can share with an inspector. And then you turn around and say, yep, see, this is how we did it. This is who gets it. And then you have all of the associated records with that. Because again, records being organized is the key here. Inspectors know if it takes you 45 minutes to go get your HASCOM plan, what you're doing. They know you're out there, you know, either you don't have it or you're just totally unprepared and that's never a good starting point for an inspection. So again, be ready. Most people, and I see this a lot, they say the OSHA 300 log, oh, that's not my responsibility. And I always say, well, it should be because the OSHA 300 log is going to show you where the systemic problems are at your facility. You may realize that there's a lot of back injuries or there's a lot of chemical exposures or anything like that where, you know, again, it's giving you key, key information about where your program is and where it needs improvement. Because OSHA inspectors are going to ask you for that OSHA 300 log because they're going to be looking for a couple of different things, right? One of them they're going to be looking for, are you completing the log? I, I go to some clients and they'll be like, oh yeah, we haven't had any injuries, so where's your log? And it's now October, and they don't even have a log started. And they're like, no, you should have started that on January 1, is at least have a form all filled out and ready, and if you have any injuries, then you answer them. Otherwise, it's perfectly fine. But at least you have the form. Conduct internal inspections. You should be doing your own internal inspect. How prepared are you? When was the last time you audited your own facility for compliance purposes? 
and I always say, you know, EHS managers, we're great, we know our stuff, but guess what? We can have blinders on too. I remember years ago when I was in an EHS manager, my old boss said to me, hey, I want to, I'm going to hire somebody to come in and take a look at us and all that. I said, why? Our facility is perfect. That's how I felt. Well, it was a very humbling experience when somebody else came in and found a bunch of, you know, I call them minor issues, but things that you kind of get blinded to over a period of time. And it was like, wow, this is great to have other people looking at what you do. Some people do it. They do multiple different locations will come in and take a look, and others will say, you know, just do it internally or, like I said, you hire somebody externally, whatever works for you. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta ensure you are enforcing all of your current programs. Written programs are great; they look great on a shelf, but if they're not performance-based, then it, they just don't work. OSHA has become much more performance-based, just to make sure they're actually going out in the field now and saying, "Hey, your program says you're doing this. Are you really doing it? And are the employees really following through with it? And if they're not following through with it," What are you doing about it? How are you enforcing it? Are you taking disciplinary action? Have you done more training? What have you done? They want to see those types of elements because that's all part of a very good program as time goes on. So you really, really want to make sure that everything is in place, it's good, you're ready. Okay. So again, kind of what have we done? You know, again, just kind of summarizing some of this is again, we've you know gone, we do it, you know, we did a survey at a you know, client of all the potential compliance issues, and then we trained all the employees on what to do when they arrived. Again, we found multiple different issues that were found, and we, they all were addressed, and then the facility visited not too long after that, which coincidentally, right, and the facility was to found have no violations in their program. So this is all about that preparedness. Again, if you're sitting there and you're questioning your programs, that's not a good thing. You know, you really want to seek out help and to make sure of it, okay? Again, there's another one. This was a higher ed account that, you know, they were visited by OSHA, you know, employee complaints. Because people always ask, right, well, how do I get inspected by OSHA? Well, number one, OSHA complaint. If somebody calls up, right? So an employee's, you know, mad at you for some reason, and, you know, they could say, hey, we, there's something wrong here, and blah, 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 blah. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it isn't. So we assisted them with the complaint, we corrected it, we trained the staff, you know, on what to do when the OSHA inspectors came back, and when they did, they were commended for the thoroughness of their response. Because you will, employee complaints are going to be the number one way you get inspected. From there, the second way you get inspected is typically you've got a high injury rate. Then also, or you're on a target list. So there's all these different ways, because I know a lot of people always ask, well, how do we get inspected? And the number one way is employee complaints. Because we, everybody on this call, right, all your employees are all 100% satisfied in their jobs, right? And they think that, you know, they're well compensated and everything's perfect, right? Unfortunately, we don't live in that utopia. So it, it is the number one way. So, you know, and, you, and one of two things happens when they do the complaint. Either OSHA will come visit you, or you get a letter in the mail saying, hey, this, you know, we got a complaint, we want more information, and, you know, they'll either show up after that, after you give them the information, or that's the end of it. So you really just always want to be prepared, because, you know, some OSHA inspections, believe it or not, are just, they're driving by your facility. And they're like, oh, wow, hey, we haven't seen that name in a long time, or, you might have a construction activity going on outside that though they're doing something wrong, and all of a sudden they got your name now, and they go, "Hey, we're going to go visit them." So there's multiple different ways that you can get inspected, but the key, the key, key, key thing here is to be prepared for it. And the more you can do proactively, it's much, much better when they are there because you really want to prove to them that you are prepared, that you have a good program. What's the likelihood of them finding something wrong? Well, we all know none of our facilities are absolutely perfect, but if we can get into that 99, 99.5% percentile, you know, of being ready and good to go, typically these inspections go very well because they know that if you're really, really trying, they're going to go a lot easier on you than if you just kind of turn a blind eye to things and not really show them that they're passionate about how safe you want to be or how in compliant of the rules things are going to go much worse for you. 
Okay, with that, James, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions. Thanks, Rick. And we do have a few already in the queue. Um, we, we didn't manage to scare too many people away. It looks like the bulk of our audience is sticking around, which is great. Uh, so please, uh, if you have a question for Rick, to go ahead and, and type that in. Uh, and we'll get to as many as we can before the top of the hour. And, and don't worry, if we don't get to yours, like I said earlier, we'll make sure we follow up uh, after the webinar. So Rick, let's get started with those that have come in already. Um, there are some good ones here, a couple repeat themes that I think we'll highlight. Um, our first question asks, how common are inspections at state universities? I know you, you had a case study there at the end uh, in the higher ed arena, but how common is it in your experience? Well, for state universities, it's, it's usually lower um, since, again, depending on your state, you've got two different types of OSHA programs. You've got the, you know, you have the federal OSHA and then you have the state OSHA, so it depends on your state. But, like, uh, you know, for the most part, it, it's a little bit less based on the fact that they have a harder time, and in most cases, they cannot fine you. It's more they can just give you violations, but... I know some states that's different, so that's why I want to be careful. But for the most part, state universities are a lot lower. It's usually more in the private universities that you see, but I don't want everybody to say, oh, good, I'm a state university, I won't get inspected. That is not true. Mm -hmm. It's just the likelihood is a little bit less, but it doesn't mean it goes away. Still possible. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Raymond wants to know, uh, I have an OSHA inspector request. Um, I've had an OSHA inspector request to conduct employee interviews in private. Is this a common practice? It can be done. Right. Well, unfortunately, it depends on if they're union employees. Also, the private, you know, in private interviews can be done. They, you know, the union representative can be present also. Okay. okay but it, it is in the rules that they can do private. In, in, yeah. I'm sorry. Private interviews. Yes. And we've seen this question before, kind of worded differently. You know, does OSHA have the right to shut you out? And it sounds like, in some cases, yes. Yeah, in some cases, yes, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Robert wants to know, what is the general practice of recording a conference versus taking notes? Most people just take notes. You would have to get their permission to, you know, to actually audio tape them is what I'm thinking, kind of like, you know, voice recording them. You would have to get their permission to do that, and you know I've not heard of anybody allowing that. Usually they say no, but you know that's something you would have to request of the inspector prior to doing it, because I know there's some legal, there's other legal requirements around that that you know you want to be cautious of. Okay, got it. Um, great, thanks for that. And, and Bill asks, is there a threshold or a uh, of the number of employees that will make OSHA more likely to inspect? No, it, it varies. Usually, you know, the lesser employees, so like under 10, right, then certain regulations, you know, get a little bit more relaxed. But no, I, I'm not aware of the amount of employees. It really comes down to typically is the, you know, the, the industries, and again, remember we use the general term industries here, is they look at the higher hazard industries first. And every year, you know, during the fiscal year, they published, you know, the, the most dangerous list, if you will, is those people with a high injury rate or, you know, those are the ones that are going to go after first. So to say the amount of employees, no, it really depends on, you know, what is the emphasis programs that they have. When an emphasis program is they go after a certain sector and say, okay, we're going to really focus on health care or long-term facilities, or chemical manufacturers, or universities. They kind of come up with these emphasis programs that are more predominant than to say the amount of employees. No, you couldn't. Does OSHA require a permit to enter the facility? This is a question from Carl. A permit to enter a facility? Right. I'm not aware of a permit. I, I just want to be clear on the question. That's the question. Is they don't they're going to basically, they show up, and the first thing you want to do is request identification. And they will have identification that shows that they are an OSHA inspectors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you were to refuse them entry, well, then typically what they would do, and it's not a good thing to do, is they could go get a search warrant to enter your facility. Right. So it's we, not necessarily a good thing. Right, right. We want to avoid that. 
Okay. Yes. So, so no, uh, in your understanding, there's no permit that, that is required. Correct. Uh, a question from Michael. For a facility that employs a third-party building manager who is responsible to create and monitor the appropriate plans. Oh, and that's where it cuts off. <laughs> so any insight there when we have a third-party uh, building manager who is responsible for these plans? What's sort of their responsibility in this ordeal? Well, to me, if, if it's a third party that's responsible for it, I, I would request copies of them, say that, you know, it, in your absence or something like that, hey, I'd like to know that, you know, these things do exist so that I can ensure that I'm, you know, following the procedures that you have in place. Okay. So that that's really the best thing you can do because if an OSHA, OSHA comes in, they only care about compliance, and you know you're going to have to define why. Why are you not responsible for it if you are the employer? Because it really comes down to the employer is responsible for all of these regulations. You know, I, they're probably looking at is something like electrical safety and say, hey, we have nothing to do with the electrical panels and you know arc flash with things like that, which is a very common one. And I agree, it's just but you know you got to say, hey, we don't maintain it, we don't do anything, but you better have that. I always recommend you have that very clearly identified, you know, in a in the documents that say we don't deal with that substructure whatsoever as part of our lease, and that's the you know the landlord's responsibility. Great, good advice there. Thanks. Uh, let's take what are we at? 52. We'll take a few more questions and we'll we'll start to wrap things up. Uh, here's one from Diana. Does a company have the right to ask OSHA not to take photos or video? You have the right, but, you know, it's going to be one of these, you know, why? And mm -hmm. if they really want to get pushy, they can, you know, they can, you know, you can have them sign, you know, a document that says that these are, you know, proprietary, trade secret, whatever words you want me to use. Um, that That is typical because we all know that certain industries, you, you don't allow pictures. That's something you want to work out with, uh, you know, that you want to work that out in advance right. so that you know that how to do it. So you can ask, but but I guess OSHA has the right to, to decline. They still have the right if they really want to, right. but typically they're going to work with you on that. Okay. All right. Um, so let's do two more here. Uh, next, how do you get management buy-in for uh, a safety program like the one you've described here today? It's always the hardest part is to get management to buy in is you got to show them that, you know, like today, the best way to do it today is around the cost. As we all know, any injuries can cost astronomical numbers. You know, it, every time you look at the number, it keeps going up higher and higher and higher, and it's, you know, somewhere in that thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a day range when they take into consideration hospitalization, employee morale, you know, anything like that, not to mention the potential OSHA fines not to mention, you know, all of the other items that go along with it is, you know, you're really a good safety program shows you're committed to the employees as well as their safety when they leave their facility because I always say, like, an injury doesn't just affect the employee. It affects their family. It affects their coworkers. You know, it affects everybody all the way along. So it's really just showing them, you know, there is a value to this. You know, we keep saying a lot of this is behavior-based or, know really you know again showing the value because most CEOs or anybody like that and if the CEOs on the line I know this isn't true for everybody but the bottom line comes first and a really good safety program is going to help them increase that bottom line because people feel like they're safe at work their morale is going to go up you don't have the high cost of workers compensation you don't have the high hospital cost your medical insurance you know, hopefully it will remain where it is because we all know those costs keep going astronomical. So anything like that is really how it helps to play out in the end. So it, it's difficult, but it can be done. It's just really showing them what the value is to everybody. Right, and that's the key. Good. Exactly. Our last uh, question comes from Mark. Is there a height limit, this one's pretty specific, a height limit for stacking 55-gallon drums of hazardous material? What kind, it, it comes down to what kind of hazardous materials, what kind of, you know, you could be getting into NFPA regulations, uh, local fire department, depending on what the materials are. So, you know, how are they secured? 
So it's it's the answer is yes, but I can't give a definitive yes. It depends on the materials, location. Right. There's a lot of other questions that would go along with that. Understood. We, we need more. So we'll follow up with Mark and uh, and see if we can okay. help him out there. Yeah. Very good. So I imagine if, if there isn't a comprehensive plan in place, to, you know, this is a lot of information to take in. So Rick, uh, I guess some final food for thought. Where would you recommend starting in this initiative? I'd say the first place to go is the OSHA website. It, there's a wealth of information you know, on the OSHA website that, you know, you can actually go around and of course, you're gonna, you know, I got to do a little sales pitch, right? Reach out to us too. Um, but no, really the OSHA website is the best place. I always caution people when you do a search for OSHA information, like online, if you Google it or whatever, you know, you can get a lot of other people's opinion, but I, I always go to the OSHA website and click on the regulation, and then if you, again, if you click on the hyperlink on the regulation, it'll take you to letters of interpretation where it's actually more of a layman's term to understand what the rule says. So really, to me, that's the best advice I can give you is to go there first. Great. Well, thanks, Rick. We really appreciate the, the informative presentation. I hope everyone who attended uh, is able to, to take away some tips that you can apply um, as you revisit your own plan. Um, so at this point, we'll, we'll wrap up the webinar. Uh, it looks like we've got a, a couple minutes to spare, so we're on time. Um, I encourage those of you with additional questions to reach out. I'll be following up tomorrow um, with the presentation. So, so those of you that, that asked, yes, you will get the presentation uh, and the webinar recording tomorrow. Um, and I'll include a couple other links. Next week, we have a webinar on Thursday on the new pharmaceutical waste rule that's been proposed by the EPA. So those of you in, in healthcare uh, may be interested in attending that one. It's on the 18th. Uh, at 2 p.m., so same time as this one. Appreciate your, your time, your attention, uh, and some great questions. Uh, really good discussion here today. Thanks again, Rick, and uh, we hope to see everyone next time. Take care. Thank you.